all for coming to our panel, mediated and, or Mediating and Mediated Distractions from the Beautiful Forms of Human Life. And we're going to go ahead and start out with uh, Eric Grabowski from Dickinson State University with the Filmic Arts and the Moral Imagination. <clears throat> thank you, and thank you for this adaptation. Including the uh, field of communication and rhetorical studies, the concept of moral imagination resonates with scholars of multiple disciplines who work from a variety of philosophical perspectives. For instance, Paula Tompkins has linked moral imagination to communication ethics in terms of understanding both perspectives and possibilities regarding ethical reflection and ethical action. I would suggest a reading of Max Stevenson's article, The Permanent Things and the Role of Moral Imagination in Organizational Life, Revisiting the Foundations of Public and Nonprofit Leadership from the 2007 issue of Administrative Theory and Praxis. A bit more directly to my presentation of today, I would like to mention the dissertation and rhetoric of moral imagination, The Persuasions of Russell Kirk by Jonathan Lemon Jones, which is available through Texas A&M University. Scholars of various disciplines, such as Jeremy Beer and Gleaves Whitney, are consider, have considered Kirk's notions of moral imagination and the permanent things in relation to rhetoric. Russell Amos Kirk is known for carrying forward the notion of moral imagination from the ideas of 18th century English statesman Edmund Burke. Some here present might be familiar with Kirk's impactful book, The Conservative Mind, which was originally published in 1953. Across his corpus, Kirk privileged moral imagination as a framework of ethical consideration when grappling with issues in areas such as history, politics, and literature. Per its generalized classical grounding, his notion of moral imagination can be accurately characterized as moral realism. Notwithstanding Kirk's sensitivities with certain modern postmodern inclinations, as discussed by Gerald Rosello and others, he was guided by the truth of the constancy of human nature across time and place. Objectively and subjectively, there is virtue and there is vice. Kirk thought and wrote about such matters in terms of both revealed religion and the natural law. Vegan Geroin's book, Rallying the Really Human Things, The Moral Imagination in Politics, Literature, and Everyday Life provides helpful discussions along these lines regarding Kirk's work in particular and moral imagination in general. My own philosophical biases are strongly towards the classical realism of Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas. This necessarily points to moral realism for ethics, both theoretical and applied. Of course, there are varieties of realism, both classical and contemporary. The basic suppositions about the constancy of human nature and the independence of reality are somewhat common across these varieties of realism. Marshall McLuhan, for instance, held to those basic realist assumptions. Kirk's overall approach to the moral imagination can be helpfully applied to the rhetorical criticism of film, particularly in terms of the aesthetic, rational, and ethical capacities of audiences. At bottom, Kirk points towards significant rhetorical coordinates for ascertaining the achievements and distractions of the filmic arts with respect to the moral dimensions of our lives, both as individuals and in communities. With respect to the theme and rationale of our panel here today, it can be said that certain types of mediation seem to be more prone to distract our attention from those essential and excellent forms that make up the adventure of life. Arguably, the filmic arts demonstrate in a significant way the ongoing dynamic of distraction and achievement for human communication that persists across media. Kirk was, like his friend Richard Weaver, very suspicious of the uh, visual components of technologies that had arisen in predominance uh, from the 1950 onward. Um, and this should not be discounted in terms of the form and delivery, whether you were thinking about television or you were thinking about uh, the filmic arts in an actual movie theater. Uh, it's certainly in terms of form and delivery and presence um, as a general matter that cannot be discounted even from rhetorical criticism. Uh, uh, some key thinkers have thought about Kirk's work in aesthetic terms. Uh, earlier, Donald Atwell Zoll, and eventually later, Wesley McDonald, 
had talked about the ascetic conservatism, the ascetic criticism of literature and history and ethics that Kirk brought to the table, which is true, very much grounded, though, in a classical context. Um, I want to remind here James Hyken, a realist writer on rhetoric, though, reminds us that any consideration of aesthetics must realize that any aesthetic work is grounded in a context of reality in one way or another. But again, technological concerns uh, with regard to film, uh, whether it be distraction learning, etc., should not be discounted. Uh, I had argued about four years ago at an NCA, a panel media ecology, that Richard M. Weaver should be brought to the table of media ecology, and particularly his critiques of, of the media of his time in the 40s and 50s in the book, Ideas Have Consequences. And of course, he and Kirk were friends and fellow travelers, though not always in agreement, but on the same page in many ways. And in fact, Kirk and Weaver's work is very complementary in, in certain respects. Uh, in basic ways, there are parallels and overlaps between the methods and types of film criticism and rhetorical criticism. I don't purport to be an expert in film criticism. Um, I'll only mention here the book that I often use to teach in my media classes, Bernard Dick's Anatomy of Film, 6th edition. Uh, but just through teaching it and reading about it and even beyond that text, obviously there are parallels just like between rhetorical criticism and literary criticism, and rhetorical uh, criticism and art criticism. Since my main idea here today is the role of moral imagination for the rhetorical criticism of film, I will highlight a few of my own operative assumptions regarding the work of the critic of rhetoric. A close read viewing of the movie as such is essential for the sake of understanding both the dramatic and rhetorical elements of the film production. Depending upon focus, this may or may not entail a study of the script of the movie if available to the critic. A substantial understanding of the visual and verbal workings of a movie is precursory to any dramatic, linguistic, or ideological reflection with respect to the quality and scope of criticism. Regarding rhetoric, though, that dimension beyond the dramatic works, the primary canon is invention. Like with the speaker or writer, determining the sources and categories of arguments should guide, not eclipse, matters of arrangement, style, delivery, and memory for the rhetorical critic. I think that Weaver in his day, and eventually recently philosopher Eugene Garver has made uh, a good case for the centrality of argument, hence invention, uh, as the guiding uh, element for rhetoric. Of course, with movies, you are dealing with a fictitious or factual production, depending on the type of movie. Um, certainly, when you think about the rhetoric of movies, you have to consider elements of style and delivery and memory, of course, because movies often tap into our individual and collective memories for the sake of entertainment and marketing and for the dramatic and poetic dimensions of it. Um, but again, if you're thinking of it in terms of the rhetoric of the movie, it's ultimately whether it is embodied in the words of the characters or in the scene or the setting, a la Edmund, uh, Kenneth Burke, uh, you ultimately have to think is what is the guiding argument or set of arguments in the film. But to Kirk, uh, Kirk often a, um, thought about the 19th century notion that imagination rules the world. And his view of moral imagination, um, and he stated this on a number of occasions, uh, reflects the fact that we are moral beings. Now, of course, with regard to film, whether you are a pre-modernist or a post-modernist or somewhere in between, uh, we know that for a film or a drama or anything really to be good fiction, there has to be some sense of moral choice and moral adventure. Um, so, uh, with Kirk, though, of course, accepting that view, he thought that the ways in which literature and drama on stage and other such artistic productions uh, can help us, they give us long views of history, they give us uh, ideas about human adventure and choice beyond the sort of sensual, uh, everyday uh, choices that modern man and woman tend to get caught up in. Um, Kirk himself, in general, was a realist. Um, at times he's more Aristotelian, at times he's more of a platonic high realist, but his assumptions are generally classical or pre-modern in scope. Kirk's approach to moral imagination, both for his own fiction writing and his social criticism in history, was moral, but he said it was not didactic. Um, and it did uh, have a sense of depiction, depicting that great moral struggle of humanity. Uh, in that sense, I think that, and, and 
other sources I think bear this out, that the best way to think about what happens in a movie is in line of ceremonial rhetoric or epideictic rhetoric. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that we can't think about the rhetoric or the message of a movie in terms of judicial rhetoric or forensic rhetoric, that is to say some argument about the past, um, or even informing deliberative rhetoric in some way. But at bottom, I think it's most sound to look at a movie or a filmic production just like on stage as linking the poetic to the rhetorical arts by means of ceremonial or epideictic rhetoric. It's praise and blame of virtues and values through places, characters, and the actions of those characters and those values and virtues themselves. Um, for Kirk, it was very, the notion of moral imagination was very much tied to his understanding of the balance between individual order and the communal order, that the order of the soul is directly related to the uh, order of the commonwealth, which is an Edmund Burke notion that he continued. It is the job of the moral imagination to show us moral excellence. It also gives us what I believe a balanced view of moral agency. There's obviously for good reason a lot made about modernity's um, uh, problematic emphasis on individualism with regard to agency. But the reality is, from a classical view at least, is that we are human moral agents that make choices. So that sense of depiction should tend in that direction. Kirk's view of moral imagination was also deeply interested, to, connected to history and the idea of having historical consciousness, which of course for film is important because film ultimately, directly or indirectly, makes, makes uh, affiliations uh, explicitly or epideictically to those things, just like ads do, that we have in our individual or collective memory. Um, ultimately, though, the moral imagination is a magnified understanding of human nature across time and place. So uh, regardless of the mechanics that you engage, and certainly there's a number of ways that you can do rhetorical criticism of film in terms of starting with the character, starting with the setting, the scene, all those sorts of things. Ultimately, this is a way, a way to think about the ethical dimensions of the impact of uh, the rhetoric of a movie in terms of our moral deliberation as a people. And of course, again, to reiterate, though, movies uh, are presenting a vision of the world, some set of biases about praise or blame of a given virtue or value, uh, both in their simplicity and co complexity. The notion of moral imagination can be used in different ways. And ultimately, um, it, I would say with Kirk, that it's, that it's a well-ordered or properly ordered imagination. It can be an analytical term. Kirk and others have used it that way, who write in Kirk's vein. Right? It could be a sort of categorical metaphor. Kirk talked about the idyllic imagination. Uh, 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 Vegan Groin has talked about the idolatrous imagination. But ultimately, these are ways to describe um, the dispositions of the imagination as such that a person or a community has, if you want to carry the, carry the analysis. Um, but from a classical realist view, and, and this might even be something that would line up with McLuhan, right? we have our imagination as such, uh, we engage our use of discursive reason, and we of course have those memories that we accumulate too, that also in some sense use images that put before us, and in our intersection with the world of media, particularly movies, uh, filmic uh, experiences uh, impact that. Uh, when Kirk was referring back to uh, Edmund Burke, of course, it was a passage from uh, Burke's writing on the French Revolution that they have disregarded the wardrobe of moral imagination. So by implication, this idea of the moral imagination reflects the accumulation and the correction and the customs that build over time specifically to human beings with regard to those moral choices and the lessons that we learn. So we watch a movie and explicitly or implicitly we can ask the question, um, regardless of the language used or the setting, too, is, is it presenting a vision of the world that is in some way resonating or moving that? It's, it's not necessarily going to be this discursive dialectic about the nature of life, but it's going to give us scenes and settings that point us in that direction. Um, if we were to put some medieval terminology on it too, and I'm thinking here of one of Gerald Rossello's discussions of Kirk, you know, we could think about the use of reason in two ways, intellectus and ratio, and uh, the use of the discursive reason as well as the sort of intuitive experience that we have with the world. That in some way engages uh, our uh, film, uh, stage productions, television programs, whatever. 
Um, of course, even the use of Edmund Burke can be a challenge because there are so many ways of, of uh, interpreting Edmund Burke. Uh, and I am, of course, uh, interpreting Burke here in a way like Joseph Papin does in the metaphysics of Edmund Burke in a more realist sort of way that Burke was sort of a general classical realist just because of his training, his, his statements, his arguments about politics. And hence that any notion of moral imagination along those lines points us in those directions. I also want to mention here a, a way of thinking about moral imagination that can pertain to the viewing of film and, and thinking about this in a realist sort of way. James Mess's uh, essay, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, The Ascetic and Moral Imagination, that uh, in reality we can think about recollection, refinement, and reason, and that moral imagination is the properly disposed use of, of our, our use of images and visualization that encompasses the context of reality that we experience or can experience in terms of possibility. It creates a pattern, a pattern that in, in, uh, crosses over between universals and particulars. And, uh, engages both human objectivity and subjectivity. There's a lot made today about, particularly in postmodern discussions, and I'm reminded of a conversation I even had last week with my colleague here, Anthony, that in postmodern circles, the discussion about you know, regular logic, discursive logic versus narrative logic. I really think that Kirk's more general realist approach in, in thinking of a, the, the moral imagination as this guiding framework or set of patterns going forward. Uh, helps us uh, think about really that it's, it's more complementary and rhetorical that there's not really a tension between discursive logic and narrative logic. There's logic that can be uh, engaged and played out in these sort of dialectic or didactic ways, but then there's just that, that use of the same logic, the way that Aristotle puts out the poetics, that's, that, that happens in a narrative way, and whether that's a fictitious movie about something that, that did happen or could happen or it's a documentary. It engages both of those in some ways, and even afterwards, people discuss it. It can inform other sorts of argumentative situations, etc. So Kirk emphasized the use of allegory, myth, fable, uh, rather than the rational approach. But that notion of rather is more complementary and rhetorical. It's not this sense of as opposed to, and that's bore out in a number of his works, and I'll mention a few here to look at. Moral, moral imagination is in some ways a crossroads of discursive and narrative endeavors, which of course gives us certain questions that we can think about for looking at a movie, not just in its, in its aesthetic and artistic ways, certainly that relates to the rhetorical ways, but also in the sense of what is the vision that it is giving us about the journey of human morality in the world. So as you think about, um, and then there's much more to be said here, my purpose has been to highlight Kirk's notion of moral imagination and getting the conversation going on thinking about how his particular framework can get us thinking about the um, rhetorical criticism of film in terms of uh, the human moral adventure. So I would suggest taking some of those classic texts like Aristotle's Rhetoric and Poetics and Mortimer Adler's Art and Prudence, a study in practical philosophy but also to look at two books in particular, Kirk's Enemies of the Permanent Things and The Roots of American Order. And when thinking about the message of the film, thinking about the rational, ethical, and aesthetic capacities of audiences and ways in which those messages positively or negatively engage those capacities as such, as well as the directions in which they lead, Kirk ultimately is engaging what I've called uh, rhetoric of order, a realist rhetoric of order, and a rhetoric of order guided by moral realism. If you look at the themes in Kirk's work, and I think that they are things that we ought to be thinking about, especially with some of the complexities of distracting and, and at times the achieving of things like film, that there are enemies and there are allies of the permanent things. And of course that notion of permanent things, Kirk borrowed from T.S. Eliot, those are those persistent principles and patterns through history that are good, that, that, or at least lead us to think about goodness. We take a journey through history, and when we're considering the moral implications and the practical implications of the film, is the message with the media watering and nurturing those roots of order in humanity through time and place. Thank you. All right, uh, we have a couple actual oddities that I didn't mention when 
be getting the panel. So uh, Dr. Grabowski is with us via sp Skype because uh, his father had surgery and so he couldn't make it here. Uh, so we brought him in through Skype so that he could still present. Uh, it, much bigger oddity, if you came here for uh, Andrew Jones's paper, the, uh, I don't know, I saw Sherlock Holmes and Powering Observation. His uh, Amtrak train actually got lost, no joke. Um, <laughs> it got lost somehow. The director didn't know where he was going, I guess. And so that paper, I don't know when, but it's going to be delivered, I think, tomorrow. Is that uh -huh. correct? Yeah. It'll we'll be find him another place to put it. But <laughs> So if you're here for that one, I apologize. Um, but there's still good things so being offered. Good there. Check. We'll, we'll have the registration desk know when he's going to present. So. So, that being said, uh, our next presenter is Karen Lawler from Metropolitan State University. Closing out nature, nature and the other, uh, earbuds, smartphones, and screens. It's going to be odd having Eric staring at my back there. <laughs> if you heard me make comments this morning, you'll realize that one of my uh, pet concerns at this point in my career is the idea of thinking. The importance of thinking, discerning, making choices, uh, having basis for making decisions that are based in conscious thought. I believe reflection is just a powerful tool in understanding and experiencing our human life. Each year, the Media Ecology Con uh, Convention provides us an opportunity to reflect on the nature of our experience and our lives in a mediated environment. Where else do we get to talk about stuff like this? <laughs> Kenneth Burke, I think, would agree with me that it is very human to mediate and extend what our bodies perceive <coughs> as symbols, with hierarchies, and with technology. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> Such uh, reflection, I believe, is aptly captured in the idea of the kaleidoscope. That word, I looked this up because I didn't know. The word was coined in 1817 to describe a cylindrical creation by Scottish inventor Sir David Brewster. He was working on light polarization. The word actually derives from an ancient Greek and points to beauty or beautiful in that which is seen. So that is what a kaleidoscope is, something beautiful in that which is seen. So it's also an experience of beautiful forms. I know, how many of you played with kaleidoscopes as kids, yes? And you loved them, right? You could play with those for hours. Uh, they were just enthralling with their colors and their shapes, and each of them is different. The human experience, I think, is aptly uh, likened to that kaleidoscope because our experience evolves and transforms with the changes in our lives and with the change in media landscape. The kaleidoscope that I reflect on in this paper is not filled with stained glass or jewels, wood or rocks, but filled with music, touch, and talk. Earbuds, how many of you use earbuds? Any earbud users? Oh, okay, some earbud users. Fill our ears with music, probably other things as well, but certainly music. Smartphones, I saw, I saw some of you have your, your, it's hard not to have in your hand, it really is. They allow us to talk and to text up with others. They allow us to find our way through a strange city. They allow us to look up something that uh, we don't know and, and be smart right there on the spot. So there's a, a lot of good to them. And then screens. Now we have an example of a screen today and how hard it is for you to focus on something else when that screen is in the room. Am I right? It's really distracting. So it's a perfect example. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> so as um, you know, so I think we can think about how how that all throws together into the cylinder that's our lives. Beauty, as one example of a form is an evaluative concept, yes? We won't all agree on what's beautiful. Uh, like justice, love, and courage, the concept of beauty provides stability and focus for human action. So what we think is beautiful, we focus on that. We move towards that. The same with justice or love or courage. Forms are something that we strive for. They're something that center and stabilize our lives. <coughs> Using earbuds, smartphones, and screens, expose us to beauty, don't they? I mean, we see things that we would never have seen without them. 
Screens give us access to every beautiful place on earth. Next week I'm leaving for Europe. I don't need to go to Europe. I could sit and watch Travel Channel and get all the pictures without <laughs> nearly the expense or the problem. Okay, so just think about that for a moment. Earbuds and smartphones take us to concerts that we can't necessarily attend. So they expose us, they enrich in our life. Plato notes that beautiful forms fade with time. They change, they evolve. They create differences in opinion. We might have differing views on what justice is, differing views on what love is. And so that's a normal part of the difference in forms. That, but they're felt and seen by everyone, and yet they are contextually uh, specific. Remember this morning we talked about context and the importance of that. Same is true for beautiful forms. Context means a lot. Um, our forms, though, are the foundation of our experience. Those are the things that we strive for. Those are the things that we live for. If one of our beautiful forms is achievement, which it is for probably everybody in this room, uh, we will strive for that achievement. In the Phaedrus, Plato says, but beauty, as I said before, shone in brilliance among those visions. And since we came to Earth, we found it shining most clearly through the clearest of our senses. For sight is the sharpest of the physical senses, though wisdom is not seen by it. For wisdom would arouse terrible love if such a clear image of it were granted as we come through sight. And the same is true of other lovely realities. But beauty alone has this privilege, and therefore it is most clearly seen and loveliest. So that's what I want you to have in mind as we think of beautiful forms. According to Plato, certainly it rests in what promotes knowledge and wisdom versus what gets in the way, what obstructs it. Focus and attention on beautiful forms encourages what's best in our human experience. The experience of the beautiful form changes from generation to generation, but the form itself does not. We may have different views on what love is, but the concept of love has been a con continuous concept throughout many generations. In the kaleidoscope, we see dynamic beauty in the changing shapes and the colors of the glass, beads, or jewels. Interestingly, I didn't know this either, any material can create a kaleidoscope. So when we look at something like earbuds, smartphones, and screens, they're no exception. They, too, are creating that dynamic and changing shape within our experience. We're seeing it, we're feeling it, we're experiencing that kaleidoscope within those forms. They are visual, oral, and tactile dimensions that interact with human eyes, ears, and bodies. They experience shapes, sounds, and that they can connect us to others around the world, but they can also disconnect us. And we're all excited about how they connect us. I want us to be reflecting about how they also disconnect us, how they move us away from the present moment and out of the face-to-face -face that we talked about this morning is so valuable. Earphones, earbuds, smartphones, and screens are frequently used in combination with other activities, are they not? I bet we could all list them. How about sports? You know, we're running, playing, you know, we may have earbuds in. Driving, using the smartphones, um, checking with the GPS system. Uh, during our relationships, I just saw a video yesterday, and I thought about maybe playing it for you, but I'll look it up for you. But this guy had created the face hat, and so he had this hat on his head. So while he was down looking at his text, what his uh, partner, his relational partner, saw was a face. Okay, it, it was obviously meant as making fun of our thinking that we can text and still be in a relationship. <laughs> so it was a pseudo, pseudo relationship. Uh, waiting, um, working, studying, or sleeping, we're all using different technology to kind of get through those experiences to distract us from the experience that we're in at the moment. Uh, there are also distractions, though, from higher values and goals. A higher ideal such as life, health, and safety. I'm guessing that if I asked you, you would all agree with me that you value life, you value your safety, you value health, and yet there are a lot of things that we do that move us away from that beautiful form 
and distract us from that form. And that's what I started to consider in, in putting this paper together. Um, music, talk, and touch mediated by such, such technology as earbuds, smartphones, and screens demand our focus. If I'm reading a text message, I have to shut out the rest of you in order to pay attention to that message. According to much research on multitasking, the human brain is only capable of a limited focus at any one time. Now, most of us think we can multitask, especially those of us who are mothers. We can multitask. But uh, the research kind of has mixed results on that. Smith et al. studied the effect of text messages or cell phone use on accurate recall and found that divided attention impaired true recall and increased false recall. Now, we'll fill in the gaps. What we don't recall, we'll make up something. But it's not an accurate recall. They conclude that both cell phone and text message events disable verbatim processing and um, force us to rely on gist processing. This is an interesting concept in that I realized that I am a gist processor. It means that if I have a long conversation with you or I listen to a, a talk like Eric's, I get the gist of it, but I don't remember the words verbatim. Okay, there are times when we want verbatim recall, isn't that true? You know, we want to remember what our partner says. We want to remember to report accurately to the police officer. And we can't just say, you know, give the gist of it. So the nature of distraction and the focus of attention play key roles on the cognitive impact of any technology. In spite of a general belief that we can and do effectively multitask, we can't support that. I think I already said that. By focus, I refer to something that is the center of our interest, thought, or action. The concept extends to the idea of clarity of vision. Attention is a similar concept, but not exactly the same. It connotes taking an interesting or noticing some, one implies more cognitive awareness. Okay, if I'm focusing, if I'm taking attention, I'm deliberately making a conscious choice to attend to something and to focus on it. There's no doubt that human action can make strong demands on our attention. I think our lives are so complex and we're bombarded with so much um, technology and with words and with people and with tasks that it's very difficult for us to figure out what to attend to. Um, another theory that I read was from Philip Corrales who distinguishes between those two concepts of attention. He points to these principles. He said that attention is a form of sensitivity in the monitoring of tasks. So we're attending, um, imagine that your task is making dinner. And so you're attending to the specifics of getting out the ingredients and managing that particular task. The, um, he, um, so if we took a different example and we said, okay, I'm driving my car, what am I attending to? So you may be attending to driving, you may be attending to the German tape that you're playing on your CD player learning German before going off to Europe. Um, you may be attending to radio, or you may be attending to thinking about something at work. So you're not attending to the question of, am I safe? So that, that beautiful form of safety and life and health is something that you've really moved to the back burner. It's not something you're conscious of. In other words, for, for that question to arise, we have to be pursuing a particular task. So there are a whole lot of activities that we're doing in life where we're not attending to a particular focus. Um, in order for us to attend to justice, we have to be thinking about justice. We have to be focusing on justice. So when Larry Fry this morning was talking about social activism, that just doesn't fall in our morning repertoire unless we make a conscious decision to put it there. So, Again, it's, it's what beautiful forms am I going to let my life focus on? This theorist, um, Philip, says, imagine that your task is to find a red square in a display filled with red things of various shapes and squares of various colors. Sounds easy enough. Uh, your sensory system, interestingly, registers them all. Jessica would be able to attend to that. Uh, she's my neuroscientist. In order to accomplish the assigned task, a person must devote attentional focus to parts of the scene in some kind of sequential order. So we have to look at it in a certain way in order to accomplish the task. It's interesting to me that we're less effective if we attempt to control the process. 
Um, attention keeps its object. Remember, attention's object is the task of finding the red square, while focus jumps from one object to the next until we've completed the task. So attention allows us to, to stay focused on the task. So obviously, in anything that we can do, we can be distracted. And I have no doubt that if we talked about it, and maybe tomorrow night when you come for the Friday night session, um, after the sessions tomorrow, we can, we can talk more about focus and attention. Sometimes we need to do things simultaneously. For instance, uh, we drive, and we do a variety of things while we drive. Do you remember when you were 15 and a half and learning to drive, how difficult it was to do all of those things? And yet now you have most of it in your muscle memory and you're able to attend to the more cognitive tasks while you've relegated everything else to muscle memory. And so that allows us, I think that's why mothers can do it. A lot of it's just muscle memory. And we come to, come to attention when something changes. I'm looking at Jessica because she's still got young kids. I've survived that, so I'm a role model. Um, some of us can talk on the phone and drive. I can use Bluetooth and drive, but I can't hold the phone. So um, I uh, use different things. He, he just, I, I'm having a cognitive challenge because he gave me the time. So I'm very aware of the cognitive distraction of uh, listening to my timer here. So the ability to attend to two tasks depends on how sensitive we are to the questions asked by the task. So I started thinking about this when I read reports of people who were killed in train wrecks because the engineer was texting. Did you read those stories? Okay. I also have seen runners get hit by cars because they had earbuds in. Uh, you know, so I'm very, it's like I'm, I'm very attuned to hearing those stories and saying, where was their reflection on their own safety? It's increasingly true that earbuds are being um, challenged as one, not safe for our hearing, and um, instead recommending uh, the earphones that are, are more safe for your hearing. And I had to throw in a little hearing in there. Um, a University of Maryland study revealed that there were 116 accident cases where the victim was wearing earbuds or headphones. 70% of them died. So they were fatal accidents. They weren't just tripping kind of accidents, they were fatal. So cognitive distraction and in inattentional blindness. So again, come back to this power of, of conscious awareness of what's going on in the here and now. And media is wonderful, but it takes us away from that beautiful form that we call life and health and safety. So obviously there are many, many examples, but I want you to leave here feeling consciously aware that there probably are times when you should slap your hand when it tries to grab that phone. And uh, that we really should, there are times when we shouldn't use it. That we need to make those that discernment we need to attend to things differently. I've got one more thing here that I wanted to say. Um, communication technology is wonderful. I certainly use as much of it as I can. But it's a distraction to our cognitive functioning. And it's, it's an extension of our ability. It, it helps us connect with others. But it also distracts uh, us from connecting with others. So if I'm texting in the middle of my meal with my husband, it's not enhancing our relationship. So what I'm asking us to do in this, this particular uh, thought is that beautiful forms exist for us, whether it's courage or justice, fairness, beauty, health. We need to be aware of how we're attending to them. And we need to be aware of what the distractions are that keep us from those beautiful forms. All right, last up is myself, Anthony Walks, and I will be presenting uh, Poetic Pedagogy Utilizing Entertainment as a Medium of Serious Education. And I hope uh, with educators in the room I don't become offensive on this, because this could become somewhat uh, uh, risque, per se, of what I'm saying. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try and present uh, kind of a McLuhan-esque classroom 
and uh, which comes from, if you haven't read, Media Messages in Language by McLuhan, The World is Your Classroom, and this is one of his most definitive statements on how a classroom in, in the electronic era should be set up um, to make it meaningful for students. Uh, so I definitely recommend that. Um, and so I want to give two other prefaces before I actually start this. This is actually paper stemming from uh, my colleagues' struggles with connecting with uh, the modern student that has attention problems that we were just hearing about. They, they can't focus on a lecture or even just sitting for a few minutes without checking their cell phones and whatnot. And so uh, I see entertainment is a way to hold on to their minds. And so this is kind of a response to my colleagues to say, you know, from a media ecology approach, this is how you can begin to uh, change the way you do things to be able to really connect with them. And I'm not telling you to throw out anything that you're doing if you already have successful classroom. This is just some of uh, uh, the things that I've seen work and they're grounded within media ecology which will still be uh, useful for this audience. And then the last thing I wanted to preface this with is the poetic pedagogy thing here. This is not poetry, right? You know, we classically think of poetry with nice verse and whatnot. This is uh, more coming from Burke and McLuhan that poetry is more concerned uh, with the engagement with being and with ground or the sources of our being in, in the human experience in itself. Uh, so that being said, let's move into what I see as the main challenge of education today. And when I say education, I want to note that this is uh, more of a classical orientation. This is that education is about formation, not skills training. And so this is kind of uh, directly in opposition to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation right now that wants to make good workers out of our uh, students. This is about forming human beings. Uh, and I would push you to Isaac Katz, Communication is Not a Skill, uh, chapter in a book on communicology. Absolutely amazing uh, article or chapter on what communication is as a more human-centered enterprise instead of just teaching how do you send messages and then listen to messages in a very efficient manner. Um, and education is ultimately about the movement from particularity to universality and the experience of the beautiful. This is something that was discussed last week at the Philosophy of Communication conference in uh, Pittsburgh. And so uh, within this, how can we educate our students with this in type of education in mind? And so what I say is the first thing we have to do is look to the state of the modern mind, the modern mind of our average student. And I'm going to give you a collection of different works to kind of make my claim of what is what are the characteristics of the modern mind. First and foremost, it's imminent, and we can see this through the many works of, so we have Richard Weaver, who uh, in his ideas have consequences, shows that we have a movement away from realism into nominalism and positivism and then into materialism, and what this has done is gotten us away from anything that's non-materialistic as a non-reality. So when we talk about justice, if I can't empirically taste, touch, feel it, then it must not exist. And so we get separated from the forms of the beautiful that we're concerned with here because of the movement away from realism. Then there is, I um, can't remember Randall's first name, but uh, The Making of the Modern Mind. And he uh, describes a movement away from animism here where people were existing in the world and the self was much more related to the world itself. And now we've closed ourselves off. And I would push you to, towards a secular age by... Uh, uh, Charles Taylor, where he describes what has happened to the imminent self is that we've become buffered selves, that we're removed from what he called the porous self that was integrated into nature, and now we're buffered away from that. And uh, along these lines, Owen Barfield uh, speaks of the reductionism that exists within the modern Western mind, that we reduce everything to its lowest common denominator, and then we take that as the essence or its reality, and we miss the appearances, the thing that is self-explanatory to us or self-replatory is not really real because we have to reduce it to something else. And he ties this directly with what he calls mechanomorphic thinking, whereas the modern Western mind wants to accuse the ancients of being uh, anthropo anthropocentric, or not, anthropomorphic, sorry. Uh, Barfield says, no, we're mechanomorphic. We're placing the qualities of machines onto nature, and that's just as much of a problem. And then uh, two more uh, within this, uh, the idea of the imminence. Uh, Matthew Crawford, in what I think is a must read for anybody today, but also media ecologists, 
is uh, his book that just came out, The World Beyond Your Head, on becoming an individual in an age of distraction. Uh, he argues that we can look to Kant's philosophy, so modern philosophy, as one of the sources. Among many others, he talks about technology, advertising, uh, but modern philosophy through Kant makes us imminent, in, especially in his notion of the autonomous individual. We must be free from everything else, if, or, uh, in, uh, separated from it, to be truly free. And so the individual, this buffered self, has to move itself from the world beyond its head, from others, from nature, and it separates itself and buffers itself from that. And then finally, Thomas de Zengatita in his book, Mediated, he takes this a step further and says we become mediated selves. So we're, we're not even just buffered. Our experience of reality is mediated by the things that we have watched and seen. And so what this means for us today is the modern student has no real access to the beautiful forms that we're interested in here today. Next, the next characteristic of the modern mind is that it's fragmented. I tell you go to uh, Benedict Ashley, The Way Towards Wisdom, and he uh, here describes the breakdown of metaphysics because of the specialization concerned with uh, the modern mind. When the sciences develop, we need to specialize, and we no longer have a general theory of knowledge to unify our understanding of reality. And so the mind has become fragmented because it's all these specialized sciences. Uh, right along that is Edmund Carpenter and Oh, what a blow that phantom gave me. Uh, he gives the description of modern students that they can't evaluate uh, truth claims, contrary truth claims. So when you, uh, he uses uh, Kane Mutiny, I believe is the, the movie he describes. He says, you know, you have one description here, you show it to students, and then you have them read an actual account from uh, a book that it comes from, and then you do a history account of what happened, and there's all three contrary views of what actually happened, and that the modern student says that all of them are true. I can maintain all of these contradictory ideas within my mind, and I would argue that's because of the fragmentation. This fragmentation is caused, Postman uh, talked about information bluff. We have so much information surrounding us that we no longer can make sense out of the information that's coming to us, and this is partly from the breakdown of cultural defenses that used to exist. Along these lines, Douglas Rushkoff, um, in Present Shock, has recently uh, talked about narrative breakdown. The things that hold us together is uh, uh, communities that give us a coherent vision of making sense out of information that comes to us. In reality, those things have all completely broken down, and now we're left with the, the task of making sense of pattern recognition. It's the way that he would say we mainly make sense out of the world today. And the problem with this is when not trained well, this is where you get into loopy conspiracy theories where somebody sees a video on how uh, the government and the Illuminati is taking over and they caused the Sandy Hook shooting. It all makes sense because somebody made a pattern for them to see. Um, and this is, again, because of that fragmentation. And then looking towards the cell phones, Rushkoff also says this is partly because we're digitally fragmented. When we have so many different identities online, we no longer have even a coherent sense of self. We can look to, uh, finally, Marshall McLuhan. He describes this as the condition of the global village. And for him, this is when people have moved away from any fixed perspective uh, that was generally caused through a visual epistemology in this movement into the electronic age where we're more auditory centered, and we now have no fixed pers perspective, and everything is happening all at once. And he says the condition of that sort of a mind is one of fear, because everything bad is always happening, and we were, we're concerned. Then finally, third, we have what we already talked about here is distracted individuals. We see this in Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death. The television makes us distracted people. Um, Rushkoff describes this with notifications. Our, our orientation towards reality has shifted because we're constantly getting notifications from our cell phones, always pressing on us, calling our attention to pay attention to me. So much so that we now have collective hallucinations. Anybody have a cell phone in here? Does anybody ever have phantom vibrations? Yeah, most of us have that common hallucination where we think the phone is vibrating, and it wasn't. There was nothing there. That's how distracted we are. That these things are calling to us, and we want it to call to them, and so we want it to, to vibrate, and it's not. 
And then again, I point to Matthew Crawford. He describes this as a whole environment of distraction. And the worst part of it is, is that because we're these mediated selves, we're these big corporations that pay lots of money to figure out how to best distract people, that we are now in an age of social engineering where big corporations engineer us and how we should be. So that's the state of the modern mind of the student. This is it's a distracted individual, fragmented, and it's imminent, no access to these greater forms. And so the question I have is how do we engage this modern student? And I point directly towards those three things and say we need to combat distraction, fragmentation, uh, so that we can view the beautiful forms. And so this is where I get kind of uh, controversial, is that I say that educators must entertain and amuse so that the student doesn't turn the channel. And I say this in the best sort of a way in the sense that amusement is to distract from serious things. Now think of the modern student's mind. What is serious is coming from here, and what is on the television or on Netflix. And so we amuse in the sense that we're distracting them from their distractions. And then entertain. Uh, Rushkoff gives a good definition of entertain merely is to hold one's attention or to hold, hold one's mind. And so when you are holding somebody's attention, they're being entertained, at least to some degree. And so my argument is, is that uh, to be relevant to this type of student, we must become masters of gaining, maintaining, and holding attention. And I think we can understand how to do that through McLuhan and Postman and many of the ideas of media ecologists, and I'm going to look primarily through this idea of the medium, it's the message. Um, and so first, what I'm going to do is say that we're going to offer a mosaic in terms of McLuhan to meet their fragmentation. No longer is it possible, unless you're dealing with a very high-end student who's not suffering from most of these things, to actually have a strong, linear, coherent lecture that they're going to just stay attentive to. And so I, I take McLuhan's example as a perfect way to be teaching to this fragmented mind, is to offer a mosaic. And the cool thing about the mosaic, I think, is, is that it's all these small little pieces and to the untrained eye, they just focus on the little pieces and it's, it's a mess. But when one stands back from the mosaic, they can see the picture that all the pieces make. And so as an educator, as I'm going to argue here, you have to have, at least in your own mind, what that picture is while you're presenting the mosaic. Otherwise, you and everybody else will be lost and this education will be for naught. And so what the mosaic is, is it's a non-linear form of offering ideas to students. And what I'd say is in the classroom, you have to have a place to provide lots of ideas to students where you're playing with ideas in a very, in a sense, fast sort of emotion because what's going on in the classroom, even while lecturing, if you're going to idea, to idea, to ideas, which you don't be flipping the channel for them, right? They're surfing television, and if you're just staying on one long show, most of the time, unless they are actively wanting to be a part of that show, they change the channel. So by, by playing with the ideas, you can flip through those channels in what I would consider a coherent and con within a coherent and consistent grammar. And I'll get to the grammar here in a moment. Now, the way to do this effectively, I think, is exactly through the medium is the message. And the medium of all of this is the professor. Essentially, the, me the medium, the professor becomes the medium of entertainment. Uh, so what I argue is own the popular ethos of the professor. And so what I'd say is you put on the professor. And I say put on the professor because it's what McLuhan talks about is putting on this is what mimesis is. And so what you're doing is you are, you are acting like what the popular conception of the professor is. And so for McLuhan, you're putting on a costume. And McLuhan argues that, uh, that our kind of postmodern uh, society right now, or at least the young in it, uh, is, is very concerned with costume. And you can see it in the dress that we wear. And he, uh, he says this ironically in the sense that this is the time of costume. It's the time that the Catholic Church abandons all of its costumes. This is the nuns stop wearing their, their habits. The priests stop looking like priests right at the age when people are beginning to want that sort of stuff. And so he's kind of uh, making fun of that modern movement within the church. Uh, and so what does that putting on the professor mean? What are some of the uh, expectations that are in the mind of many students other than possibly boring? It's that of eccentricity. 
And I don't think eccentricity is inherently a bad idea because in some senses, eccentricity is born in the idea of being different. One is eccentric when they are different than others, and that is a good thing to be different than the modern mind that we just described. Uh, and then also, I think eccentricity also is uh, a place of uh, taking things seriously. Eccentric people are eccentric because they take small things very seriously. And it's the same thing with ideas. When one takes ideas seriously, there is a, a degree of eccentricity that is almost implicit within that. My example that I like to play with this is a popular example is Doctor Who. Right? Doctor Who is... In, in, I think the classroom can be very much so fashioned off of what Doctor Who is. Is You're always running around with this guy who's kind of guiding you, but also letting the people that are with him, his companions, they're always growing and finding out who they are, but everything's always exciting when this is happening. He's very eccentric, and, and he blows people's minds, right? And he's just different with his orientation. And so I, I like to give the example of Doctor Who, and I don't think that's all that different from what McLuhan offered is how he functioned, is what many people have called him, he was a jokester, a prankster, you know, he says, oftentimes he says things he doesn't even believe, right, and that was a part of his mosaic approach, and so I don't think these two things are uh, contradictory. Um, and then ultimately, how when we're playing with those expectations, one of the things that you're doing is you're, you're playing with the forms of their own grammar, the grammar that is in their uh, popular culture. And I take that, the grammar terminology, not the parsing of sentences, but go to McLuhan's uh, dissertation on the trivium. Grammar was ultimately the study of literature. It's where values were formed, classically speaking. And so for this modern mind, where is that grammar found? As Postman said, it's not within cultural forms. Uh, forms that are given to us from like the church, the state, from families, it's from television, the internet. And so you're playing with popular cultural forms that they recognize and can see entertainment in. Now, this is where it gets serious though. The professor has to be the medium and embodiment of ideas. They have to be able to bring ideas to life and that means being able to be lively, energetic and passionate about those things. And I look to McLuhan's exemplar within his form of communication is Etienne Gilson and his argument of why he's one of the top philosophical communicators is because he's able to bring classical ideas and debates to life. Um, probably not because he was acting like Doctor Who, um, but because of the way that he was able to present the ideas, and I think that's extremely important. The last couple things to offer here is that this is not a process-centered approach. It has to be idea-centered. And I give the example from my basic speech course. I have students who can't pass into basic English, right? So they're in basic uh, remedial writing and reading. And then I have students that should be in an honors course, but they're not in an honors course and everywhere in between. So if I'm process-oriented, I have to teach them how to do a thesis statement, right? I can't do that, and I won't do that, because the people that haven't learned it likely don't want to learn it, and the ones that have learned it have already learned it, and they're going to be bored. And so you've just turned everybody off by being process-centered on this. And instead, come to my office, I'll show you how to write a thesis. If you're struggling with it, go to the writing center. There are all those tools for the modern student to be able to uh, learn to do these things, and it doesn't have to be happening in the classroom. So I say uh, avoid uh, that process-centeredness, and that's because, going back to Isaac Catt, we are not simply transmitters of information, um, and that's not what communication is about. Along these lines, uh, when you do process-centered uh, education, it's what McLuhan called figure minus ground. It's the typical orientation. Is it doesn't mean anything to their normal world. It's just here's this thing called a thesis, and here's how to do that. It's a figure minus its ground. Uh, so what happens in this form of education, according to McLuhan, is that you're bringing ground to the forefront. This is where ideas come from. They have to be centered around their own individual experience because when we talk about ideas of, say, justice, that may seem separated from their experience, but when presented in the right way, it connects to them in a way that they're able to understand. And this makes it perceptual instead of theoretical, which was a tremendously important form of learning. So ultimately, this is what I see as a poetic pedagogy. It helps people to uh, perceive ground and being through questions. 
and that's a part of what McLuhan wanted. And ultimately, he argued that we're supposed to enter into a science where we're asking questions that no correct answer is possible for. And what we're doing is giving students the ability to begin to answer those questions themselves. So in the final analysis, um, I think what we're doing is giving them, in this poetic pedagogy, a new form of trivium-based education, which McLuhan was for, in the sense that we're giving them a new grammar. Give them good ideas. Don't teach out of a textbook. Give them important books. Right? And then we begin to think about contrary ideas and test evidence in the dialectic. And then finally, when you're having students speak for themselves, they're engaging them to a form of rhetoric. Thank you. All right, we got plenty of time for questions. I'm going to make sure we got sound here from Dr. Kowalski. Hello? Now mm -hmm. we're a bit. All right, so questions. Yes. Uh, I, I have a question for Eric. Um, I hear you. Okay, good. What do you make of James Joyce? And I, 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 I'm saying that uh, given the premises of your argument, uh, and, and but given, but I, I will do that at the beginning. Given the premises of your argument, you take, you take your muscle curve, who argues for, you know, uh, art is a moral education, which was a tradition, by the way, I was taught, and was the tradition James Joyce came from. He moved away from that, and wrote things like Ulysses and Finning his way. Interestingly enough, a writer that uh, Kurt liked a lot, although probably for bad reasons, uh, was T.S. Eliot, uh, who he thought was really good. But if T.S. Eliot had stopped the wasteland, I doubt very much that Russell Kirk would have thought it was very good. Uh, it, 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 uh, uh, and, and certainly, I think that Eliot misread Ulysses, but, cer but, but certainly U uh, Ulysses strikes me, if we're going to consider that a, a great book, and we don't have to, but if we're going to consider that a great book, it's not a great book, it seems to me, because of its ethos. It's a great book because Joyce was deliberately trying to do something else. And he was moving away from the rhetorical. And well, literally, not, now we can say that's wrong too if we want. But I mean it was a definite challenge to literature as the rhetorical. And it's a movement in, in, in it, not a movement too because you have Marlowe and uh, Fulbert and what kept before him to literature as the aesthetic. Which struck me as kind of missing from the presentation. Yeah, it probably was for the sake of time, and that's, there's a lot of nuance there. Um, I could say with Kirk, and, and I do have in mind, by the way, his, his classic Eliot and his age. And I'm not sure if I would agree that Kirk liked Eliot for the wrong reasons, but that's another discussion. Um, I think that, <clears throat> and I'm going to reference Anthony here, um, all these guys, regardless of what moves they made, came from that, that trivium-based uh, tradition, and, and over a period of time, uh, folks are going to gravitate uh, in, in their disposition toward a rhetoric, grammar, logic sort of orientation. You know, Weaver uh, tended to graduate over time more to the, to the dialectic and the rhetoric versus the poetic, Kirk to the poetic and the rhetoric. Um, and I think that uh, to even to be able to engage the sort of question you raised in a, in a, in a general sense um, requires that sort of crossroads of moral imagination. Um, but the uh, issue is, is regardless of, of Joyce uh, or, or others who wanted to move away from the rhetorical dimensions of narrative, I'm not sure if it's possible, in as much as if, especially if you think about the ceremonial uh, or epideictic dimensions of literature. Um, so yeah, we can move into this aesthetic realm. <laughs> Richard Thames at Duquesne, and he's been talking about that in terms of Burke, but uh, I'm not sure to what extent that's ultimately possible if you take an integrated view of the trivia. Right? Well, I, I guess I, I guess I kind of question you. Integrated. Uh, I, that is not where I'd start from. I mean, I, I, and a lot of this depends upon the premises you're choosing. To I mean, I I actually find Weaver a very problematic figure. Why? Uh, because he, because he supported the Confederacy. Because what? He supported the Confederacy. 
Well, as <laughs> that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> but, 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 but it's kind of problematic. I mean, you know. Well, okay. So if if I were to look at that support of the Confederacy, as did you know, like again, I, I looked to Kirk, who who had good things to say about both you know Lincoln and Lee. Um, again, regardless of where you come down on the question of whether the uh, South had a right to secede or whether they did or, or shouldn't have, uh, uh, it, still the larger conversation holds about the trivium and the, to even have that discussion requires that level of moral imagination that Kirk's arguing for. Uh, I refer to his discussion about uh, Lincoln as a partisan of order, which Emmy Bradford, by the way, was not a big fan of, Kirk's friend, uh, about Lincoln, although someone like Kirk obviously had empathies with certain elements of the Southern tradition, too, his friend Donald Davidson and, and others. I'm not sure if that takes Weaver and Kirk's value off the table, does I it? I don't think it takes their value off the table. I think it brings in a dimension by which to look at I don't know that you dismiss anyone for any particular political stance they take, because we all end up taking laws of political stances sometime or other. But it, and, and actually, my thing about, about, about Weaver is he has, he has a little snide comments about what law he black that he kind of sneaks into his, his, uh, his essays, which I do find kind of bothersome. I mean, I, 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 again, we, even with someone I was kind of interested in for a while, and then I started reading this, I was just thinking, wait a minute here. I'm going to jump in real okay. quick, because as interesting as this debate may be, we have a lot of people here that may have other questions as well. So does anybody else have questions for any of the panelists? I have a question for Anthony. Shoot. Sure. May I? Yeah. Yeah, you, you make an argument that, that uh, I greatly agree with in terms of the grammatical and rhetorical personality of a professor. But what do we do now? The weight, with all of its accreditation and standardization, the weight of higher education, particularly coming from administrators, no offense, Karen and others, but uh, is to push against, that's, push against uh, the agency of the faculty members in terms of that sort of interestingness that you're talking about. How in the heck are we going to get this idea to spread um, when the weight of administration and the trends in higher education is trying to eke that out of the classroom? Yeah, I, I, as a young professor, I don't have much of an answer to that right now. I mean, there's a big trend in that in our state right now, and our institution at least is trying to push back the professors themselves and the institution is pushing, right? So this, it's got to be a collective movement against uh, those movements coming at us from places like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, administrators, and I was going to preface my paper with that, but this isn't necessarily uh, helpful for people that are concerned with strict assessment because we're not training skills. And so uh, for me, that's kind of the nice thing about being in a backwaters public institution is they really don't care as long as students are coming in and out of the university and not out in the sense of we're losing them, we retain them and then they're out at graduation. So it's it's a difficult question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I want to ask to uh, Karen and Anthony, uh, how do you think we can fight uh, when uh, it's a consume uh, trend to use uh, this kind of, of this connection, because it, the, I think that the, the most important um, force is the pushing of, of because you can sell by that, uh, is the, and you consume them in the life. There are you know, outside the beautiful forms there are in that YouTube. How we can fight with that? Because it is in the system, no? not only in the university. It's in the system. I think we have to make choices about how we spend our 24/7. Well, yeah, yes, but like a, a, like a teacher, like a research. How do you think we can do it? Not only us, but us like a person. I guess you know what Andrew was saying uh, certainly works for me. It's the idea of teaching students to look at a variety of different things so they start to have that cognitive ability to say, you know, there are multiple things going on here and realizing that maybe they can't all be true. If I'm, uh, a couple months ago, I was driving north on I-25 
uh, the person in front of me came to a stop. I came to a stop, but the person behind me was too close, ran right into me. Distracted driving, okay? Poor choices. Um, I think, for me, what that has really taught me is, boy, am I very conscious of not being, not picking up the phone at all when I'm driving. So sometimes it's like something big happens and you go, ooh, I can't be doing that. Um, and those kinds of our students really respect examples. They they learn a lot from narrative, and I think they they start to understand the narrative things. Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways I teach a speech and thought class, mm -hmm. and expose them to lots and lots of ideas, and it annoys them a whole lot for the first half of the semester, because they really they want to know well you know what font should I use on their the paper? I really don't care. <laughs> <laughs> You know, because that's how they've been trained all through K-12. And so we have to do something different at the college level. We have to say, these are the different ideas, let's wrestle with those a little bit. And I would add to that, that it, it comes from changing first with oneself. I tell my students this all the time, that they, they wonder about how can I change the system. And I say, well, largely you can't change the system. You can change yourself, and then from there you can begin to affect other people that you have interpersonal influence upon. And once we all become active with making those sorts of changes, that's the only way the system can change. And so for me, this is my introductory level class. We start with you know a little bit of an introduction to rhetoric, and then we move straight into Rushkoff, Postman. Um, they're going to be reading Crawford next year, and I tell them that this is you know for nothing else. We're exploring these ideas because it's audience analysis, and that's how I justify it to my administrators. Is that we're doing in-depth study into what the mind is of their audience members, but through that they get to go into a form of self-discovery where they start saying, whoa, wait a second, I'm being asked to reflect upon my own media use and how distracted I am and how much I'm thinned out. And that, I think it starts with the self and then the think, other. And I would reinforce that. In every class I teach now, I'm doing reflections. Mm -hmm. And they don't even know what that concept is. So that tells you where we're at. I mean, we're starting on uh, ground minus five. So we have to teach them to reflect, mm -hmm. tell them what that means, and, and find different things that engage them mm -hmm. in a creative way. And not having reflection is right up McLuhan's alley with no fixed perspective. It's just stuff coming at them, and they're not able to reflect even upon their own experience. So it's, it's their responsive is a healthy way of using the brain. Uh, responsive is differentiated from reactive. What our students today are doing is they're reacting to things coming at them instead of having that moment, taking that moment to calmly respond to what's in front of me. Which means that you have to really pick and choose and you probably have to minimize some of what's going on. And yeah, and unfortunately, if, we think we can do it all. And if I may, this line of discussion reflects again that delicate balance among rhetoric, grammar, and logic in the class. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. Question. Somebody had a question. It becomes a good book to read with students as shallows. Yes. yes. It works very well. And Nicholas Carr will be here talking with us Saturday afternoon. Yes. And I think yes. I, I use that one in my class. I think that by and large, um, education use um, books for professors to, to, to ask the students what's the content of the book, what the main idea is. And that's it. I mean, they don't bring the students to think but about the ideas that the author is bringing in. And I that's think a big problem. With uh, students being as self-focused as they are, that you really have to bring it back to what does this mean to me? Right. They don't want to just study the, the beautiful forms. Mm -hmm. It has to be something based in an action that they are willing to take in their own lives for themselves or for somebody else. Yeah, that's good. We have another minute or two. Is there any other questions, thoughts? So, Anthony, I was really intrigued by your idea of the mosaic, and I just wonder if you had any examples that you could lay out for us of a pattern, or maybe a bunch of little examples that when we step back, we see the big picture. Um, well, the way that I actually do mosaic when I was teaching philosophy this last semester, I think is when I most clearly stumbled upon this idea of doing it well. Um, was the idea of getting into an idea, and then what I tell students, bracket this. Sorry. I tell them, bracket this, right? And so I put it right into their mind of, 
we're stepping into something else, and for me, it's entering into oh, kind of the phenomenological study. You know, you're bracketing, right? Okay. And so I say, bracket this, and then you start going into another idea. And there might be, if they're outlining, they could probably get a coherent vision of what this is, because I'm just going to a smaller subpoint. And I'll say, oh, 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 and bracket this. One step here, and then I'll step back, okay, unbracketing, let's go back to where we were, and then let's unbracket again. And for me, by telling the student to bracket things for a second, you're just telling them, hey, we're putting this on pause or previous channel button, right? And in their mind, they're used to doing that. They can watch five shows at the same time and know what's going on in each by previous channel and whatnot. Okay. Yeah. Try to try to leave them on the Okay. All right. Our next uh, session is a plenary session over in the King Center concert hall. Something of interest to all of us, and that is water. Water is the essence of human life. Was it 95%? Thank you all for attending.